So, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to the 2018 Washington State Life Science Summit. We thank everyone for being here with us today. And at this time, we would like to welcome Brad Gray, President and Chief Executive Officer of Nanostring Technologies to the podium. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us this morning for the um, uh, Life, Wa Washington State Life Science Summit. Got to get used to the new name. Uh, I'm Brad Gray, President and CEO of Nanostring Technologies and a member of the Executive Committee of Life Science Washington. Life Science Washington uses this annual event to highlight industry news, hear from elected officials and leaders in our industry about what's uh, going on in our community, to celebrate our successes and to make plans for overcoming our challenges. It's an opportunity to reconnect with friends and with colleagues, and I always enjoy attending this event. As some of you will recall, during last year's summit, our president, Leslie Alexander, presented LSW's new strategic plan, which is built around three major priorities. They're all designed to help create a vibrant ecosystem here in Washington State for our broad, life science community. They include uh, increased talent recruitment and workforce development in our community, support for entrepreneurialism and company formation, and increasing the profile of our industry with all sorts of constituents within the government and uh, other business um, aspects both in the region and outside. I'm confident you're going to hear about our progress today as Leslie takes the stage. From my perspective, we've made a great start. At Nanostring Technologies, we hire between 50 and 100 new employees every year. We compete with many of the great companies in the room for some of the same talented employees in biomanufacturing uh, and research and development. And together, we're now working uh, to engage with uh, colleges in the region uh, to help develop new uh, pipeline of talent that can support our ongoing growth. In addition at Nanostring, we've imported numerous uh, executives and mid-level managers from outside the region because of the lack of a historical base of commercial excellence. And I'm looking forward to using our public relations efforts that you'll hear a little bit about today to increase the profile of our, uh, of our biotech in regions outside the country, like Boston, San Diego, and San Francisco, so that those employees there will know that they have the opportunity to get into on something, the ground floor of something special here in our region. The Life Science Washington staff is building the tools, developing the expertise, and convening the meetings to make this strategy a reality. However, they need our support and our participation, directly from our companies at the senior levels, as well as from our staffs. <clears throat> I know by the very fact that you are here that you care about the vitality of our community, uh, and that's a great start. Uh, and I know that time is your most precious asset to invest, and you think incredibly carefully about where you put it. I would urge you over the year ahead to think about how you can support Life Science Washington uh, and be a, a part of the community, uh, an active participant in the community. Uh, I know that that's an investment I've been making, and I've been incredibly um, uh, rewarded for doing so. After Leslie speaks, I'm thrilled that we'll have an opportunity to meet for Mark Alice, Chairman and CEO of Celgene. Like all of you, I'm eager to hear his thoughts about Celgene's commitment to the region, both through their direct presence uh, and then more recently, the uh, acquisition of Juno Therapeutics. Given comments he's already made about his company's commitment to the Seattle region uh, to make it the worldwide headquarters for cell therapy and immuno-oncology, I'm optimistic that it pretends good things. Without further ado, I'd now like to introduce our president and CEO, Dr. Leslie Alexander. Good morning. And thank you, Brad. Your leadership on our board and throughout the community is greatly appreciated. So good morning and welcome to Life Science Washington's 14th Annual Life Science Summit. It's a pleasure to be with you today. 
Joining us today, or soon will be, are several of our public leaders, including State Senator Guy Palumbo, representing Washington's first district, Brian Bonlander, director of our State Department of Commerce, and Carl Stickle, Seattle's director, the city of Seattle's director of entrepreneurship and industry. Thank you for making the time to be with us. Your support for our industry is deeply appreciated. Can someone switch in the back so that I, thank you. A big thank you to all of you whose generous support made our summit possible. I want to especially recognize our premier sponsors, Celgene, EY, and Perkins Coie, and our Wi-Fi sponsor, Nanostring Technologies. Please join me in thanking them along with all our networking, coffee break, and table sponsors. I also want to recognize our association's gold, platinum, and chairman circle leader members and thank all of you for your strong support. A gift of our appreciation is on each of your tables. While we always love to come and visit you, we, would, we hope you remember to take it with you when you go. Before I begin my formal remarks, I want to take a moment to recognize the recent loss of a giant in our community. I am referring, of course, to Paul Allen. Paul's vision, spirit of innovation, and zeal to tackle enormous quests for scientific knowledge was unrivaled. He was a risk taker with a can-do attitude who has left an incredible legacy to science and humanity. While we mourn our loss today, our summit is a time for us to recognize and celebrate the achievements of our members and focus on how we continue to build this wonderful ecosystem of ours. So let's get to it. Did you know we are part of an a industry whose total annual impact on the US economy has reached $2 trillion? According to Techonomy Partners' latest report, US bioscience firms employ 1.74 million people in jobs that pay an average wage of $99,000. So how are we doing here in Washington? Setting aside the two giants, California and Massachusetts, Washington continues to rank quite well among states with sizable life science economies. In fact, when it comes to key components of the innovation ecosystem, such as NIH funding and venture capital investments, our state is a top performer. Those strengths are reflected in NIH funding just shy of $1 billion in 2017 and life science transactions totaling more than $11.5 billion, including three highly successful exits. Even excluding the purchase prices of Juno, Cascadian Therapeutics, and Universal Cells, life science financings in Washington total $880 million over the past year. That's an impressive number. The story of Washington's life science industry, however, is much richer than the one told by our financial transactions. It is the life-saving products and services behind these transactions and their inventors that make our story so powerful. Washington's history of biomedical, impressive history of biomedical innovation is often traced back to Dr. Donald Thomas's pioneering work on bone marrow transplant at Fred Hutch. But did you know that in 1960 at UW, Dr. Belding Scribner invented a Teflon shunt that revolutionized the treatment of kidney failure? He did so by making outpatient dialysis possible. Today, over three million patients are living with a condition that previously would have been fatal. Here are some recent examples from our ecosystem. A 54% efficacy rate in the prevention of pulmonary TB from a new vaccine developed based on Infectious Disease Research Institute technology. Imagine preventing 5 million new cases of TB annually and over 700,000 deaths, many of them in children. 
a 34% survival benefit for patients with an especially aggressive form of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma from the combination of Seattle genetics, et cetera, and chemotherapy. The company is working on its FDA filing at a fevered pitch, so this proven life-saving drug can be brought to all patients in need as soon as possible. FDA clearance for adaptive biotechnologies clonoseq assay to detect and mon monitor minimal residual disease in patients with multiple myeloma and B-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia. The launch of a new phase one clinical trial of M3's novel drug designed to halt and possibly even reverse the effects of Alzheimer's disease. Great clinical data on nanostrings technology for identifying biomarkers correlated with treatment response in patients with high-risk melanoma, and on Provencia's simple blood tests for diagnosing cardiovascular disease and predicting adverse heart disease in diabetic patients. With so much great clinical news, is it any surprise that our ecosystem is expanding? Building Cure is on the rise for Seattle Children's Research Institute. Fred Hutch is expanding into the steam plant. Global bi biomanufacturer AGC Biologics has made Bothell its worldwide headquarters and plans to hire hundreds more workers there over the near term. Also in Bothell, Juno Therapeutics, a cell gene company, is massively expanding its CAR-T manufacturing cap capabilities. Huge new buildings under development by Alexandria Real Estate Equities and Biomed Realty demonstrate long-term confidence in our local life science and tech clusters. We are especially excited about Alexandria's newest life science building, 1818 Fairview, which is not only going to be a vibrant and beautiful innovation hub for our industry, but Life Science Washington's new home when it is completed next year. And while Dexter Yard will not break ground until Q1 next year, Biomed's commitment to proceed on this striking new building in South Lake Union without an anchor tenant is a very bullish statement. Fueled by steady investment in STEM infrastructure at our colleges and universities, and the committed engagement of regional partners, the life sciences are growing beyond Western Washington. In Spokane, a VISTA development recently broke ground on the University District Catalyst Building, a 159,000 square foot innovation center anchored by Eastern Washington University's computer science, electrical engineering, and visual communication design programs. With plans to house over 1,000 students, this development will greatly increase the capacity of regional workforce in disciplines very, very related to the life sciences. Over time, the Catalyst Building is expected to be part of a 770,000 acre, I'm sorry, 770 acre, that'd be pretty impressive, <laughs> U District and Bioscience Hub that connects to Spokane's hospital district. With a vision to support entrepreneurs, imagine the possibilities. Life Science Washington has been nurturing entrepreneurs and supporting emerging companies for many years, and we remain committed to this priority. We provide our entrepreneurs with mentoring and consulting services, connections to angel and seed capital, SBIR training, networking opportunities, and online resources such as our digital playbooks and innovation marketplace. Some of these programs and tools were made possible from grants by the Life Science Discovery Fund, regretfully now in its final days. Last year, we established a charitable nonprofit arm of our association, Life Science Washington Institute, to help us access new sources of funding and engage new partners for our entrepreneurship activities. Led by, led by Dr. Frank Velasquez, former chairman and CEO of PAML, an LSW board member, our institute is dedicated to encouraging and supporting the organic growth of life science companies taking place around the state. We are enthusiastic about emerging opportunities to help regional partners develop their life science assets 
not only in east, eastern Washington, but in Vancouver and Tacoma as well. For example, after adding life sciences to its list of strategic industries, the Columbia River Economic Development Council, assisted by a small strategic investment from the state, was able to recruit ABSI to Vancouver in late 2016. At that time, ABSI had 13 employees and occupied 7,200 square feet in downtown Vancouver. Today, ABSI is thriving in Vancouver with 28 employees, Whoops. with 28 employees and three open positions and, ex and an expansion underway that will double their space in the same building. Later this morning, we will hear from, Sh from CEO Sean McLean about creative ways the company is preparing their future work workforce in partnership with local schools and WSU Vancouver. In Tacoma, RAIN, the Readiness Acceleration and Innovation Network, just celebrated its one-year anniversary. This nonprofit life science incubator is focused on educating its community to grow jobs, talent, and companies in biotech. We look forward to helping them do so. Of course, with most of our life science startups located in the greater Puget Sound, we will continue to partner with organizations seeking to build a supportive ecosystem for our local entrepreneurs. While there are many of you in the audience for which we are grateful, I want to give a special shout out to the city of Seattle and Carl Stickle in particular for supporting our WIN mentoring program and related consulting services for the past several years. Thank you, Carl. Another of our strategic priorities is to elevate the visibility and stature of the life science industry throughout the state. As you are all aware, despite having a great story to tell, our industry often gets lost or forgotten among the greater tech industry in Washington. One of our goals over the coming year is to change that. This is why I'm excited to tell you about a new PR initiative we launched this summer in partnership with Raffetto Herman Strategic Communications and Strategies 360 to build visibility for Washington's life science industry across the state and nation. Our initiative has two main objectives, to bring the perception of our industry up to date with reality among policy makers and business leaders throughout the state, and to attract more highly skilled professionals to Washington. Through our research, we identified five themes that make Washington's life science industry and ecosystem special. History and momentum. Our state's biotech, med device, and digital health companies have transformed cancer therapy, produced the first treatment for rheumatoid, rheumatoid arthritis, and introduced the world to life-saving defibrillators. This dynamic statewide industry is once again on the cusp of introducing a new generation of therapies and cures that will dramatically improve human health worldwide. Pioneering spirit, the same, theme that the same spirit that gave rise to Boeing, Microsoft, Starbucks, and Amazon, and other innovation-driven companies also drives life science growth in Washington State. Ours is an open and collaborative ecosystem full of emerging dynamic companies that support each other and aren't afraid to take risks. Of course, our global impact. Companies in Washington's life science ecosystem have ready access to world-class universities and research institutes. These institutions are forging advancements with a profound global impact working to address epic challenges like eradicating malaria and HIV and beating cancer through remarkable new therapies. Tech convergence. As a renowned tech hub, the Pacific Northwest is home to top tier talent, specializing in cloud computing, big data, and machine learning. This offers a highly skilled knowledge community and talent pool for life science companies seeking to leverage tech to power the next generation of innovation. And last but not least, the Pacific Northwest lifestyle. People who move to Washington stay here because of the family-friendly community, 
strong schools, abundant jobs, and unparalleled quality of life. We are using these themes to create messages that will allow us to talk about the industry in a way that captures its momentum and unique attributes. We are also developing a PR strategy to collect stories demonstrating momentum that we can share with reporters in Washington and beyond. We know that you are all working on some amazing life-changing healthcare technologies and treatments, and we want to promote that great work. So if you have a compelling, invented here in Washington story that you want to share, please let us know. Additionally, we are creating a series of videos that capture the excitement for our life science industry. Our goal is to provide video content that can be shared, not just by Life Science Washington, but by you, your employees, and your HR departments via social media with potential employees throughout the country to create a buzz about the great things happening here in Washington. We're also working on a presentation deck that will tell the story of Washington life, the Washington life science industry. Like the videos, the deck will be made available to our members so that all of you can share the impact our industry is having on our state and the world. We look forward to rolling out these PR assets over the next year and are optimistic that working together we can modernize perceptions of our industry with key audiences in the state and positively impact our talent recruitment efforts. Ensuring our members have access to the workers they require to continue growing in Washington is a top strategic priority for our association. And we understand that out-of-state recruitment for specialized talent is a necessity for many of our companies. Our ecosystem simply does not have a sufficient supply of highly skilled and experienced talent to meet the demand. However, even with a great PR campaign, recruiting specialized talent is time consuming and expensive and not a workforce acquisition strategy for the long term. We must do more to attract our own young people into the wonderful careers offered in the life sciences. <laughs> Yay. We have terrific students to work with from secondary through postgraduate, but too few of them are exposed to opportunities in industry through internships, on the job training experiences, or even a survey course that introduces them to life science professions and their impact on human health. Moreover, graduates who exit higher ed with scientific degrees are often unprepared to work in a highly regulated environment. Many of them also lack the soft skills essential to working as part of a team. So how are we going to turn things around and why am I optimistic it can be done? In April, Cascadia President Eric Murray and I convened a day-long Life Science Workforce Summit in Bothell. We were motivated to do so by the steady stream of news from member companies sharing their plans for expansion and searching for more trained workers. Almost 70 people in our regional life science community participated in this summit, including HR and operational leaders from a dozen member companies and educators from seven institutes of higher education, from Bothell to Bellevue. Economic development partners such as Matt Smith from Snohomish Economic Alliance and the Bothell Innovation Partnership Zone were also in the mix, as, with, as was Senator Palumbo. This was a first of its kind gathering, a long overdue conversation in which higher ed administrators, biotech and med device company leaders exchanged fundamental information about their organizations. The colleges described the degrees and certificate programs they offer to life science students, while industry leaders describe their product lines and the skills they need most from their job applicants. The discussion was lively and informative, and the feedback was enormously positive. There is clearly an appetite to work together to meet our shared workforce needs. However, we quickly appreciated that more in-depth work was needed to identify and, and document what specific education and training gaps prevent students from acquiring the necessary qualifications to work in our industry sectors? 
Thanks to special funding secured by Senator Palumbo in this year's budget, a national leader in life science workforce education was hired to conduct a detailed study on industry needs versus current educational programs, a gap analysis. After dozens of interviews, intense review of curricula and site visits, the final report was detailed was detailed in its findings and recommendations, laying out a comprehensive roadmap to close identified gaps efficiently with lots of industry guidance along the way. The, the report was delivered to the project steering committee on which I represented our industry in early September and subsequently shared with the six, with the six community college community and technical colleges, and UW Bothell. Since then, leaders of those institutions have met to discuss the findings and begin to lay out an action plan to meet the identified workforce needs of our industry sectors. While still in the formative stages, the plan recognizes the urgent need of our companies for more workers trained in compliance and regulatory skills and notes that this training could potentially begin immediately by taking advantage of existing programs and resources at Everett Community College. The plan also identifies the special capabilities of Lake Washington Institute of Technology in relation to medical device engineering and Bellevue College with respect to nucleic acid and assay applications. And it supports the development of stackable credentials at Shoreline Community College modifying its biotech program such that it is endorsed by industry. This will give students confidence that their degree programs are well aligned with job recruitments. Life Science Washington is eager to help Shoreline expand its nationally recognized biotech program in this way. In fact, we recently joined the college and Juno Therapeutics, a cell gene company, in applying for a small workforce development grant from the National Institute for Innovation in Manufacturing Biopharmaceuticals, also known as NIMBLE, to support this effort. We are optimistic about the grant, but no, either way, this important work will continue thanks to Celgene support and anticipated participation from other local biomanufacturers. While much work remains to be done, we are making great progress on our workforce development initiative. I think the greatest challenge to quickly ramping up industry-relevant life, life science programs at our institutes of higher ed is ensuring strong industry involvement with all of these institutions as they work to meet our needs. It is essential that representatives from med device, biomanufacturing, and biotech companies participate in this process. Our higher ed institutions will need your time, expertise, and guidance as they work to fully examine and modify specific courses and majors so they are aligned with the jobs of today and, and the jobs of tomorrow. Our work to build the supply of well-trained workers for all our industry sectors is dovetailing perfectly with a broader statewide effort to improve career-connected learning for K-12 students in, our, in the state. The goal of Career Connect Washington is to increase the percentage of high school students who achieve a post-secondary credential from today's 40% to 70% by 2030, with a significant focus on STEM and other high demand jobs. Yesterday, Governor Inslee received a comprehensive strategic plan to achieve this goal. Over 3,000 Washingtonians helped develop the plan, with business leadership provided by industry association executives and company CEOs. Former Juno CEO and now Celgene board member, Hans Bishop, and I were active, particip active participants in the process, and we support the plan enthusiastically. Work is already underway with Life Science Washington member companies to develop programs that will expose, prepare, and help launch young Washingtonians into the wonderful jobs that exist in our industry today and the new ones that will evolve with tomorrow's innovation. 
You're going to hear from some of the champions of these workforce development activities in our panel discussion later this morning. As you listen, please be thinking about how you or someone or some ones from your organization can participate. It is now my great pleasure to introduce you to Gaurav Gupta, a global client service partner and advisory account leader for EY in the biotech and biopharma industries. Gaurav is a global account leader for two of EY's strategic life science accounts and has worked with many global corporations and market leaders with a special focus on life science and media and, and entertainment companies. He has built and led multidisciplinary teams at key clients, including BMS, Celgene, Carnival Cruise Lines, Disney, J&J, &J, Merck, and Pfizer. Quite a client list. And with a resume filled with so many impressive achievements, I could not choose to, which to share with you this, this morning. So I am going to share them all. Just kidding. Let me just say that Gaurav is an avid runner who is training for his first marathon and an aspiring chef. He made time to fly across the country from New Jersey just for the privilege of being able to introduce today's keynote speaker, Mark Allis. We are, we are delighted that he did so. Welcome, Gaurav. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Leslie. On behalf of EY, uh, we truly appreciate the opportunity to support Life Science Washington and all the amazing biotech companies in this region uh, doing life-saving research that benefits us all. We are fortunate to work with many of these companies on a range of important initiatives, including our prior audit relationship with Juno and our broad and strategic relationship with Celgene. It is my privilege and honor to introduce Mark Alice, Chairman and CEO of Celgene as our keynote speaker. Mark assumed the role of CEO and joined the Celgene Board of Directors in March 2016, with the role of chairman being added in early 2018. Previously, he held various senior executive positions, including president and chief operating officer, global head of hematology and oncology, and Celgene's chief commercial officer. Before joining Celgene in 2004, Mark was vice president of the US oncology business at Aventus Pharmaceuticals. After earning his Bachelor of Science degree from Lock Haven University of Pennsylvania and serving as a captain in the United States Marine Corps, Mark began his 30-year career in the pharmaceutical industry at Bayer and worked at Centacor before its acquisition by Johnson & Johnson. He is a member of the Board of Directors of the Pharmaceutical Manufacturers of America and the European Federation of the Pharmaceutical Industries and Associations. Mark also serves on the board of Gilda's Club NYC, a nonprofit organization dedicated to helping families of people living with cancer. Please join me in welcoming to the podium Mark Alice, Chairman and CEO of Celgene. Thank you. So my brother from New Jersey flew over with me last night just to do that. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Um, yes, exactly. He's not just an auditor, he's an all-around good guy. Good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. A couple things strike me just as we get started. One is the tremendous progress that Leslie described about Life Science Washington. So this is the first time I've attended the event. I know it's been a, uh, an annual, very, very important event for the life cycle uh, ecosystem in Washington. But Leslie, congratulations on all the great work. I think we should applause the group again for what you've done. I also need to give a shout out to table three, four, and five, because these are my colleagues from Juno and Celgene. Uh, thank you for showing up early this morning. Great to see you. Uh, in particular, the leadership of our immuno-oncology center of excellence, which is located in Seattle. Part of that is Juno, obviously part of that is Celgene, and together, uh, I'll talk about how that represents our interests here in the local region but globally, so Ann Lee, Ann's right here, and then Terry Foy, where's Terry? Terry's right here on table four, so thanks for being here this morning, and so many of my other great colleagues. 
Um, when I got the invitation letter to join you from Leslie, it read in part that I had a lot of flexibility about what to say. You don't know me. That's a dangerous thing. Uh, who knows what I might say, but you remember the letter. It also then said, would you be willing to talk about the extraordinary transformation that's happening in the cancer field? Sure. And would you also then talk about how all of that is affecting so many stakeholders, from politicians, policymakers, the financial toxicity that comes from a lot of what it is that happens in this ecosystem today, particularly at our focus on patients? Would I do that? And I, absolutely, I'm, I'm thrilled to do that. But I thought the way to do that today was to try in this room of innovators to suggest what's possible, to answer the question, what's possible with all of you. Everyone in the room on the back of a Paul Allen story can put life into such context. The first thing is, why do we celebrate Paul Allen? Well, he's a billionaire. So our pop culture puts us in a position where we celebrate success like that. He's a technology entrepreneur with Bill Gates, almost mythological in terms of how Microsoft was discovered, developed, and has created so much value for so many people all over the world. He's a rock star. I don't know if you knew, Paul Allen's a great guitar player. My son's a guitar player, and he looks up to Paul Allen. He called me the day he passed away, and I thought, oh, here's my son. He's finally figuring out what healthcare is all about and what Hodgkin's lymphoma is. And he said, you know, he's a great rock star, and I'm going to miss his art. He plays with Eric Clapton. Like, okay, that makes sense. There's another reason to love Paul Allen. But why is it that when someone like Paul Allen passes away, we call it out? In Seattle, it makes perfect sense. But the whole world paused for a second and said, Paul Allen passed away. And he passed away at 65 of Hodgkin's lymphoma. What's with that? How does that happen? So I'm going to talk about the what's possible because I think Paul Allen's life as a tech entrepreneur is what we're all trying to in some way capture, but do it in our way in how we think about innovation. So from a housekeeping point of view, I also want to let you know there's nothing more exciting than starting out a day in a room full of innovators and entrepreneurs. So I think all of you should give all of yourselves a round of applause for being great medical entrepreneurs. Thank you. So I thank Leslie and I thank Life, Sci Life Science Washington for the opportunity to be here today. To start out and answer the question, what's possible, I thought maybe I should not take for granted that you know a lot about Celgene and the company that I represent. But I do think it is, again, what all of us would like to participate in while we work through this vi virtuous cycle of, of, of value from innovation, discovery, development, and then, of course, can all of us become viable companies one day with big, successful economic profiles? So let me, let me just take you back to why I joined Celgene and see if it resonates with how you think about what you're trying to do today and for the next many years. I had been in the industry for a long time. My children, three of them, were in high school. Uh, I got a phone call from a recruiter in New Jersey who said, hey, Celgene's looking for a head of their cancer business. It's a very small company, 300 people. And by the way, they have a drug called thalidomide. Ring a bell? Everybody remember thalidomide? I thought, yeah, I know all about that. I don't think that's going to attract me very well. Uh, but then I did some reading and I found out that analogs of thalidomide were in development for diseases like multiple myeloma, myelodysplastic syndromes, and certain leukemias. And I thought, maybe I should look into this a little bit more. It's a startup. I was getting a little bit long in my career, about 20 years in, and I thought, this might be the startup that I want to think about. It's in New Jersey. It's my backyard. Why not? So I joined in 2004. In 2005, we launched a product called Revlimid for multiple myeloma. The median survival for multiple myeloma in 2005 with autologous bone marrow transplant and all-in median survival for all patients was around about three years, 2005. Today, because of some nine to 10 molecules and antibodies that have been approved for this disease, median survival is greater than 10 years. 
And some people think it's not estimable because it's a disease of elderly people. So if you get myeloma at 70 and you can be effectively treated for another 10 to 15 years, you die from old age, not from an incurable blood cancer. That's happened since 2005. What else happened? In 2004, when I joined, Celgene had 200 employees. It had its 17th year in a row of net operating losses. I don't have to tell anybody in the room who is a startup what that means. It's a very difficult cycle year after year to raise money and try to find yourself in a position to get up in the morning and keep pushing forward as hard as you can to be able to someday become profitable. Because like it or not, these are businesses. If you don't generate cash, if you don't make a profit, you will go out of business. It's just a question of time, not if. So 2004, we launch our products. Revenues are in the $200 million range. And then in 2010, that number grew to $4 billion. We also went from a zip code in New Jersey, Warren, to 70 countries around the world and close to 4,000 employees. Today, yesterday, we had our third quarter earnings call with the street. You wouldn't know it from our share price, but I'll talk about that another time. Um, we had a record quarter. We guided to a beaten raise on the top line of better than $15 billion and earnings per share that are the envy of Biopharma in terms of growth profile. We have 8,600 employees around the world and we're distributing and selling eight different products, seven of them for cancer, one for an immunologic condition called psoriasis and uh, complications of it, arthritis. So what's possible? What's possible that in 15 years, not only have we done that, but we've treated over a million patients with our innovative therapies and have changed median survival for myeloma, lymphoma, and increasingly because of our partnership with Juno as part of our approach to CAR-T therapy, we will do the same thing for a form of leukemia, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. So from thalidomide, the most vilified drug in the history of mankind, and it should be, to where we are today is what's possible for any company. This shouldn't be isolated, and here's the other reason why as Leslie points out today. Technology is advancing so much so that what's happening now is you can literally start a biotech in your garage. Think Paul Allen, think Steve Jobs, think when the computer did not exist but they created it. Now we have teenagers in high schools around the world who through computer and computational biology uh, abilities, uh, coding, et cetera, they're able through artificial intelligence and from their, their own uh, computer in their homes, talk about and think about correlating prognostic predictive features from literature that 10 years ago would have been impossible even for a company like Celgene. And today people can do it from their home. We are accelerating at a pace that has never existed before. You know that, but Leslie talked about some examples of some successes that come out of Seattle, Seattle Genetics, and what they're doing in the lymphoma world. Juno Therapeutics and CAR-T. 10 years ago, the notion that we could extract through apheresis tumor cells from a host, genetically modify then the environment of that macro environment of a patient's own plasma with tumor cells, then return them to that patient after they've been expanded with T cells and other immune enhanced cells to kill, uh, be directed to a certain antigen target, CD19 in this case. No one would have dreamed it 10 years ago. 10 years ago, no one could have looked at the literature and said, there's a thing called PD-1, PD-L1, the so-called checkpoint inhibitors in oncology. If you read Journal of Clinical Oncology, read New England Journal of Medicine, read any journals, and it would be very difficult to find any references to T-cell checkpoint inhibitors and solid tumors just 10 years ago. 
What's happened in the last five? Patients with non-small cell lung cancer are living longer and better than ever on the back of immunotherapy. I'll give you the story of Jimmy Carter. If you haven't heard it, you should hear about what's possible with immunotherapy. Jimmy Carter, our former president, was diagnosed with metastatic melanoma. He had a lesion to his brain. The people in the room who are physicians or who know the space know that is a death sentence. When you're diagnosed with melanoma, it's already difficult. But thank you, Bristol Myers Squibb, with your voice, Obdivo, et cetera. But Jimmy Carter was diagnosed where the brain, his lesion had uh, metastasized to his brain. That is death within weeks, not years. He got on the investigational study of Obdivo early on, and his lesion disappeared. Now, think about that. The problem with brain cancer, brain metastases, is you can't get drugs through the blood-brain barrier. So this drug did what? It trained his immune system to recognize metastatic melanoma and, in fact, cure him. So where does public policy intersect with innovation? In Georgia, there's the Jimmy Carter Law, which says that if you have a cancer, like he did, you get access to checkpoint inhibitors regardless of your ability to afford them. That's a pretty good thing. That's a great story. First, of innovation. Second, of a celebrity. And third, how it changed an entire state and how they think about creating access to therapies like, in this case, Obdivo. What's possible? It's pretty amazing. Think about my own company. In the window that we talked about on the back of a drug for myeloma, which is a rare orphan disease, supported by public policy and tax credits that have existed at the national level, federal level, for a long time, where if you're doing certain kinds of research, you're able to get write-offs and other considerations that, if you take advantage of it, could be quite profound. And of course, Celgene did that. But what did we do with some success? We created a partnership model that has become largely the envy of the in industry. All the products that we have in our pipeline now that form our next wave of innovation are partnered through deals we've done wherever science took us. We have a purpose statement like you do, the mission statement for Life Science Washington, which is to change the course of human health through bold pursuits in science. If you're going to live up to that purpose, and whatever you do and what your organization does, that means you better be chasing it down every day, regardless of where it is. And that'll bring me to Seattle and Juno in just a minute. Last night in New York City, the Pre-Gallion Awards were held. I'm not sure if everyone in the room knows what the Pre-Gallion Award is, but it is the most prestigious award for new molecules, new medicines, granted on the back of, of probably the most famous uh, researcher, at least historically, uh, Galleon, in the context of pharmacology and science. Our partner, Agios, out of Cambridge in Boston, uh, out of 19 nominations, along with Celgene, won the award for a drug called Idifa. This is our third win of the Pre-Galleon Award. So why do we celebrate? Here's what's possible. Nine years ago, Agios was a startup on a piece of paper. We met some venture capital people who said, hey, these guys are studying cancer metabolism. And by the way, there's a guy named David Schenkine who's starting it up, and Ann Lee, a Terry Foy, anyone in the room who is looking to build something, this is what's possible. So he did a lot of work at Genentech. We knew him well. I knew him well from a previous life. And we thought, we're going to be early investors in Agios. Agios then, within seven years working with us, identifies a very specific mutation, genetic driver of acute myeloid leukemia, IDH1 and 2. IDFA is a drug that targets the IDH2 mutation in subsets of AML. What's possible? Seven years ago, we didn't know 
that IDH2 and 1 were specific mutation drivers for AML. Now we do. Seven years ago, we didn't even have the chemical matter that became IDFA. Now it's a marketed product. Seven years ago, if you had that subset of AML, you had weeks to live. Now I've met people, and on the cover of, of our annual report for last year is a gentleman by the name, I'll just use his first name, Ralph, who is in deep remission with a pill a day because the drug is attacking that mutation driver and is keeping him in remission with a pill a day, nothing else. Seven years ago, Ralph would be dead because we didn't have the product. That's what's possible. Leslie talked about other therapies. At ESMO a week ago, our product, Abraxane, in combination with checkpoint inhibitors, improved for the first time ever in a randomized phase three trial in combination with a checkpoint inhibitor from Roche, T-centric, survival in women with a subset of metastatic breast cancer called triple negative disease. If you know breast cancer, you know that's the difficult one. If you're triple negative, it means you don't really respond and can't be treated with most of the important therapies, including Herceptin. Now, women have an updated opportunity to be able to live longer and better with a very terrible form of the disease. We've been chasing down science, I have, all of you probably have, for a long time. But you are living now, and we are coming together today in a city, a region, that I'll just tell you, after we closed the Juno transaction, I described it like this to Governor Ensley. We had a phone call about Celgene and, and what was happening with Juno. And as I joked with him a little bit, I said two, a couple things. One. What our goal, and I will tell you this, uh, my colleagues know this, what Celgene's goal in Seattle is to make it as well known a region and city for Boeing, Amazon, Microsoft, but also for immuno-oncology. I was quite specific with the governor that it shouldn't, in my mind, be a, an incubator for all biotech. Our view, and by the way, we have 1,000 employees now, in the Seattle, greater Seattle area, is to make it our center of excellence worldwide for immuno-oncology. That is all, all things immune-related, T-cell biologically related science for the treatment of cancer. So when you think about where we are, we had already decided in 2015 to partner with Juno because we were following science. We invested a billion dollars into Juno in 2015. It was a strategic partnership. We were looking for a long range opportunity in the field of CAR-T. Celgene was part of the bidding process for what was the University of Pennsylvania program and the Carl June CD19 directed program. We lost out to Novartis, but I would argue this is what serendipity is all about. Because we lost out, we're in a much better place. The Juno integration, the Juno transaction, has put us in a position to have a pipeline, not just a product. To have a group of scientists who are transforming not just this first generation, but thinking about next generation. To have a group that already had manufacturing in place that we are now optimizing and building next generation around. What's possible? We were following science and we found Juno. Now, we're one company trying to take forward curative intent. Here's the problem in cancer today. The incidence of cancer isn't really changing that much. Certain diseases, yes. The problem today is we're doing so well at acutely treating the disease surgically through radiation, even, yes, chemotherapy, the way we thought about it historically. But with immuno-oncology now, the whole shift is going from incidence to prevalence. Quality of life, living in Washington State, living in Seattle, people think about quality of life. Most people today think about quality of life around cancer and wonder, how do I afford the medicines that will keep me alive? Because they will. But what do I do to solve for that? 
So all of us working together not only have to be thinking about the acute diagnostic and intervention approach to save somebody's life, which is becoming ironically easier, but now the shift to chronic control of cancer, and then yes, what happens when over time those medicines consume so much of what an individual or what society is thinking about with respect to healthcare. We can't just solve for the biologic issue. We have to be solving holistically for what we're in fact achieving. We're not dealing with that well enough. I would argue that that's a cause that Life Science Washington could be really rallying around, real world evidence, the kinds of things we need to relieve, we need to do to relieve financial toxicity. But what a great problem to have. You don't worry about financial toxicity if you're not dealing with saving somebody's life. Why CAR-T? We think we can cure people with cancer. Cell gene is existing to not incrementally try to do well, but to step up and look for subsets. Brad and I talked about homogeneity earlier uh, this morning, where you define the best therapeutic outcome. You wanna know why cancer therapy costs so much? It's not because of the unit cost of the medicine, it's because we still treat empirically across huge heterogeneous groups of patients. And then we hope to find 30% or 40% who might benefit, and then we celebrate. But the 60% who didn't benefit, what happens to them? The system is paying for all that, but getting no real benefit. And I don't have to tell you about the, the toll on families. So we're extremely focused on this, and I would put it a call to action, that it's about the quality of life of the patients we're helping, as well as defining who should get treated, and unfortunately, who probably should not get treated. With CAR-T therapy, with our Juno partnership, that's not a question. That's not a question. We know these patients have the cell surface marker. We know that when they get back the product, they should be a responder. The issue is, can you give it back therapeutically and manage the toxicity? When you destroy tumors like that, you create a lot of toxic uh, burden on the patient. So that balance is really, really important. And again, our Juno colleagues have gone a long way to taking care of that. Why Seattle? Because the Fred Hutch is something that I grew up knowing is the center of the universe when it comes to bone marrow transplant, hematology, and how we think about excellence in science. Reputation matters, and it matters a lot. Today, we have, at any one point in time, 30 to 40 studies that involve clinical trial sites in the state of Washington. Since I joined Celgene, something in the range of 150 trials that we've done in our portfolio of cancer drugs have flowed through sites in this great region, and largely because of the academic public partnership. More of that needs to be talked about. There is an entire ecosystem of clinical trials being done here in Washington, and in my opinion, a lot more could be done. So think about the patient, the academic center, what you're doing, and how to get into that environment where very virtuously, your medicine is being tested locally, and of course then it's recognized globally. So we come full circle to innovation. And as I close, I just want to once again remind you that this cycle of innovation that we're on, that it is possible and that it does work. Leading Celgene, I'm living proof that risk takers, entrepreneurs, people who look to actually change human health can produce medical miracles and literally change the course of people's lives. The economic benefit Leslie talked about a lot. I'll just tell you at Celgene, we easily have had a thousand people who become millionaires on the back of the economic success of the company. We have an entrepreneurial culture where everyone's a shareholder, which means when we do well, they do well. When we don't do well, obviously, if you're a shareholder, you don't do as well. So I think this what's possible story is what I hope you'll take back today and recognize it's worth it. It is absolutely worth it. I'll close 
with two anecdotes that come from our Juno colleagues. Uh, two people, one Nick, one Kate. Nick is a 30-some-year-old firefighter who ended up with lymphoma, ended up finding his way to a CAR-T therapy study that was done by Juno in advance of our decision to acquire. Nick had failed all of the existing therapies known. He really was facing his mortality. And he came on the study and watched his tumors disappear within one treatment. Kate is a marathon runner. We heard about you know, marathon runners today, and you don't associate 31-year-old uh, people who are marathon runners with cancer that threatens their lives. Kate also got on the Juno trial, and I'm sure, because I've seen some of the video, some of my colleagues here probably know who Kate is personally. She is also in complete remission. The last patient I'll tell you about is someone I've gotten to know very well. Her name is Sheree, Sheree Reniker. Sheree is 55 years old. She's a mother, an entrepreneur. She's a free spirit, yoga, all of that. So really uh, lights up the room. She has multiple myeloma and over a seven year period had 13 lines of therapy, 13 different lines of therapy. The best response she ever achieved was a partial response. And if you know anything about cancer, you know, if all you do is keep getting PRs, you're not gonna do very well over time. She was so sick that she could not actually take a plane from Houston, where she lives, to Nashville, Tennessee, where the trial for one of our other CAR-T therapies is being conducted. So her family rented a van, put a bed mattress in the back of it, so she could lay down for the 14-hour ride from Houston to Nashville on the hope that she might qualify for the clinical trial. Turns out she did, and after one cycle of another approach to CAR-T that we have, she's in complete remission and now is speaking regularly on, the, on behalf of innovators and what it means to keep looking at, in fact, cure. So I started with what's possible, I'll end with what's possible. Somebody in this room, maybe many of you in this room, will create the next cell gene, and I can't wait to come back and celebrate when we do. Leslie, thank you again for the opportunity to be here with you today. Welcome, it's so great to meet so many people and be here to my Celgene colleagues and especially leading the, the, the Juno team here today. Thank you, uh, and I'm happy to take any questions if we have time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again, everybody. Hey, thank you, Mark. Uh, at this time, we are going to be taking a 15-minute coffee break, so we encourage everyone to please visit all of our sponsored tables in the coffee break area, help yourself to another round of coffee, and we will be reconvening in about 15 minutes. Thank you. At this time, we would like to introduce Dr. Frank Velasquez, Executive Director of the Life Science Washington Institute, to the podium, who will be presenting this year's Innovator of the Year Award. Good morning. I don't see my picture up there, by the way, but that's a different story. Well, uh, welcome. Pleasure to be here. There you go. That's me. And in case you're wondering, that is the Fox Theater behind me in Spokane, that shiny stuff. So it is my pleasure to be here and be able to introduce uh, the recipient of this award. But before I do that, I want to tell you three quick things. Uh, one is, I want to say hi to my colleagues from Eastern Washington, Table 30, 
back there, and the students, up and coming leaders on table 26 over there. Hello. These are our future leaders. Second, I'm frequently asked, uh, since my company was acquired last year, why don't you go back to Boston, New York, Dallas, all these other places that I've been to? You know the answer to our question? So I think Leslie articulated why is it that I'm here and staying here. And it's pretty obvious. We have succeeded in the past. We are succeeding in the present. And we have the brightest future in the country. So I really want to be part of that, which is the reason why I'm still here and will stay for however long you guys want me to stay. You can clap. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> then third, um, I do have a, a sort of like a professional, personal an anecdote. Uh, some of you know that I'm a physician by training, and I did start as a blood banker taking care of uh, patients with adult leukemias and multiple myeloma. More than five years ago and less than 50, we didn't have um, smartphones at that point, if you're wondering what the age is. And my first day on the job as a faculty at Boston University Medical Center, I show up with my long white coat, all shiny, all with my name on it. I'm very impressed by that. And I have a patient uh, whom I'll call Edward, that's not his real name, in his 60s. He's sitting in the apheresis chair because he was going to have a plasma exchange because of his multiple myeloma. So he's sitting over there with his arms like this already, his mid-60s. His wife is sitting on a chair next to him with a notebook, kind of keeping track of stuff. She looks at me, uh, pushes up her glasses up. Are you old enough to be a doctor? I was very young, and I said, ma'am, I am, and I will show you my license. But anyway, be that as it may, the reason why I bring that up is because of innovation. So uh, Edward passed away. Because as our previous speaker mentioned, many years ago, uh, diseases like that were a death sentence. In today's environment, he will have died of old age. And that is actually what innovation means. Now, the marriage of Seljin and Juno was a significant event for this community. And um, given the fact that there were uh, prior recipients of the award. We have another recipient uh, this year. But before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about innovation. So if you go and uh, Google innovation, you get about 3,033 definitions. I'm going to read you one that I found that I liked, because I think it's very apropos to uh, today's uh, event. And innovation is the fundamental way the company brings constant, constant value to their customer's business or life, and consequently their shareholders and stakeholders. Very short, but it's all about longitudinal benefit, specifically to those that we take care of. Innovation as a process is uh, very complex, is very challenging, and a very, uh, sometimes very frustrating, as many in the room, myself included, can um, attest to. But those who persevere will not only succeed, but will also have had a positive impact on the lives of many, which is what we're here for. In order to succeed, an organization must evolve its way of thinking, planning, and executing. This sometimes changes the structure of the company, but not the desire to achieve to better the lives of others. Often, to deliver, an organization may need to partner, we heard about that earlier, align with others, or morph completely in the pursuit of excellence. Today's recipient of the Innovation of the Year Award, and I'm gonna disclose who it is, uh, Cascadian Therapeutics, is a clear example of this process of evolution in the pursuit of the greater goals. I'll quote from its um, CEO, Cascadian Therapeutics was reborn out of Seattle-based Oncothyrum and its prior Canadian entity, Biomira, 
Why is that important? Because we see this longitudinal progression of organizations that come together to form something greater to the benefit of all of us. This company most recently joined the family of Seattle Genetics, another great example of innovation, which will allow both companies to deliver an enhanced clinical pipeline of therapeutics specifically for patients with cancer and very specifically for patients with uh, metastatic breast cancer. And given the fact that this is October, still, yeah, National um, uh, Breast Awareness, Ca Breast Cancer Awareness Month, I think it's very appropriate that they're recipients of this award. At the time of the transaction, Dr. Clay Siegel, the president and CEO of Seattle Genetics, said the following, and I will quote, this acquisition will enhance our late stage clinical pipeline with a best in class, best in class, orally available and highly selective TKI, it's not a baseball term, is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor for patients with HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer. Key words there, orally available, best of class, TKI. As our previous speaker uh, mentioned, we have evolved significantly in the treatment of cancer in a variety of ways. Scott Myers, President CEO of Cascadian, at that time of the transaction, said the following. This rep agreement represents a very positive outcome for patients with HER2 expressing cancers. First and foremost, patients, our employees, and our stockholders. Why is that important? Because that is the common good and the total benefit, as our previous speaker had alluded to. In addition, we do know that the pipeline, pipeline will provide benefit in other forms of cancer, so we're looking forward to that future. So within the context of that great innovation and the coming together of those two great companies, it is my privilege and pleasure to present this year's Innovation of the Year Award to Cascadian Therapeutics, and I understand that Luke Walker is here to receive the award on behalf of the organization. Luke. Thank you. Uh, Scott Myers is out of the country today, but on behalf of the uh, former leadership team of Cascadian Therapeutics and the board of directors, I want to thank Life Science Washington for uh, recognizing the hard work of the Cascadian team as well as really the vision and leadership and resources of Seattle Genetics. Um, this transaction, I think, really represents uh, or ha is, is an important nod to the uh, fundamental strength of the uh, life science community here in Washington State. Um, but I think more importantly, uh, represents really a significant step in getting therapies to uh, cancer patients more effectively and efficiently. Um, so thank you very much. Um, so with that, I would like to call to the podium uh, Tom uh, Clement, who is the founder of Aqueduct Crit Critical Care, um, uh, board Chair of Life Sciences Washington Institute, my board, and co-founder of WINGS, the Medical Technology Angels. Uh, Tom, please. All right. I, uh, I have the honor of introducing the Volunteers of the Year uh, awards for um, this year, on behalf of Life Science Washington, these two gentlemen, and I can't see you, but Eric and Billy might as well come on forward. Um, these two gentlemen have been instrumental in re-energizing our angel network uh, named WINGS. WINGS is an uh, investment group of angels that invest in med technology, something that we formed uh, going, on, <coughs> excuse me, going on 10 years now. <coughs> so uh, as we have transformed... These two gentlemen have taken leadership roles on the board as chair and vice chair. And what I, I start reading about them and trying to figure out what I'm going to say. I know them pretty well. Um, 
every, they have a lot of things in common, right? They're energized. They're, they've become, they have been big company executives. They're entrepreneurs. They've started companies. Now they're both CEOs of startups. Uh, these are the kind of people that the engine just runs and runs and runs. So Wings is a volunteer organization. The work they're recognized for here today is a lot of extra time that they put in uh, outside of all the rest of their responsibilities. So it's my honor to give you guys this award. So I'd just first like to say thank you to my friend Tom and to Leslie and Life Science Washington for this recognition. It really is an honor. And I'd like to say that as an entrepreneur and as an investor, I know it's really hard to launch and ramp these early stage companies that are so important to our ecosystem. And I would encourage all of you to consider getting involved and volunteering, whether as a mentor at Life Science Washington or judging pitch competitions at the U Jobs Comb Ocean. The, these companies, these founders could really benefit from your experience. And I think you'd be amazed at the creativity and energy that's in these early stage companies. And I think you'd find it really rewarding. Thank you. Hello, I'm Bill Waller. And I just want to thank our whole Wings team, including Leslie Alexander, who's on our board, um, Marin Nelson, who's here, chairs our screening committee, and share just one thing that we've done under this great team, and that's broaden out. We were the med tech angels and only medical devices. We're now all life sciences. So take another look at Wings. We really are trying to work hard with Life Science Washington and this whole Washington ecosystem. And I think it's just a great group and a great opportunity now that we're for all life sciences. Great, congratulations to all of our winners. We thank you for all of your hard work and congratulations once again. We would like to welcome Meg O'Connor Banneker of Banneker Public Affairs and Life Science Washington Workforce Consultant, who will be moderating our panel today addressing Washington's life science workforce challenges. Thank you from the, to the voice of God up there. <laughs> Brian, very nice job. Well, what a vantage point I have had with Leslie over the last 10 months. We have been out to your companies. We've been learning about your innovative technologies. We have talked with your HR people about their day-to-day -day challenges. We've also been connecting with educational leaders, talking with administrators in our higher education uh, colleges across the region. We've talked with their students. We've talked with biotech high school teachers, of which there are plenty. And we've talked with dozens of STEM advocates. And we've done this to better understand where the, life science washing, where, where the life science industry can engage with education and wh where the opportunities are to get started right away. One year ago, this community decided that workforce development was going to be its highest priority. And within months, Leslie and I asked for your help. Many of you who are really busy people, you answered our call. You showed up at meetings. And you told us about some of your company's toughest challenges, hiring terrific people with the right skills to come into your company and get the job done. The community also got involved because, as more than one HR professional told us, we simply cannot recruit our way out of this challenge. It's time to look inside the state of Washington. The other thing I think that brought us together is the fact that projects like this just don't come along that often, where you can reach out and have an impact on the lives of tens of thousands of kids. And so people were just eager to do that because they, they love kids. They've got kids in their lives. And they see that there are great jobs in this industry that are going unfilled. And some of our children know nothing about this sector and all the verticals it represents. So our starting point, and of course, no newsflash here, is that there are hundreds of great jobs available in the state of Washington. Biomanufacturing, bioengineering, medical device manufacturing, biotechnology. The companies are large and small. 
And the fact that I'm talking about manufacturing is really exciting. That is on an upswing in our state, and it's something we haven't, we haven't seen before. And what this means is that we can now start to look to a broader number of individuals to come and take a look at our companies in our sector. Maybe they're individuals who don't have a four-year degree. Maybe instead they have a two-year degree or a terrific, a terrific certificate that puts them right in the running for a great job where they can use the skills that they've learned elsewhere. I forgot about my slides. Maybe they did too. Are they up there? No, I'm up there. Okay, we need slides. I gotta put my glasses on too because I won't be able to see them. There they are, okay. So take a look at that. Right now, only 40% of our students who cross that stage and capture their diploma, only 40% have a plan to go on to post-secondary education, 40%. So we've gotta do something about that. And we need to start when they're kids because there's research that shows by middle school, young people are already starting to formulate opinions about what they like, what they don't like. You know, many cast off math and science as too hard. Algebra is a huge stumbling point for young people. The state of Washington recognizes this too, and as they have been focused on STEM education for, for many years, they're now starting to tie that together with the opportunities for careers in our state, and that's different. There we go. So the project is called Career Connect Washington, and hopefully the young people in your life are gonna tell you more about it as well. It was just handed to the governor yesterday by Maud Dadon, the former uh, leader of the Seattle Chamber of Commerce. She has taken this on and, and with great gusto. And the goal is in, by the year 2030, to have 70% of our kids graduating and entering into a career launch experience. Now that could be going to college, it could also be a paid internship or an apprenticeship. Um, it could also be a great certificate that gives them applied, applied skills, again, to go to work. So, and the, ni the nice thing about Career Connect Washington is that we have had a seat at the table. Leslie Alexander and Hans Bishop, as, as Leslie mentioned earlier, they have been involved with this and they are wholeheartedly endorsing it and we will be asking for, for your help in implementing it. So now it's my pleasure to introduce people who have been there in, on this project for some time. They've been extraordinary volunteers with terrific ideas. So I would like to welcome to the stage, um, are they here? <laughs> I thought they were here. My, my guests, Gustavo Mahler, Sean McLean, Senator Guy Palumbo, and Kelly Snyder. And I'm gonna invite you guys to more formally introduce yourselves and tell you what, tell you what, how you have come to this issue. So I want to start by asking the audience a question. How many of you have jobs open in your companies? Raise your hand if you know you have jobs open in your companies. Come on, raise them higher. Okay, and how many of you are optimistic that those jobs are gonna be filled near term. Yeah, so that's, that, that's where we are. There are hundreds of jobs out there, so I wanna start with each of you to, um, to address that, you know, and we're just gonna go down the line. Sean, why do you think there are so many fantastic jobs? What are we, what are we not doing that, that perhaps other states are doing? I think one of the things is really focusing on our youth and internship programs and, and one of the things Absai is, is doing uh, is, is really empowering uh, high school students and college students uh, through internships at, at, at Absai, and that's one thing that we are, are doing uh, in Absai to, to help uh, uh, with, with education and, and really giving the, the, the students uh, the, the job experience that, that's needed, whether it's working for our company or, or other companies out there. And we're gonna get into more details about that, but I also am remiss because I didn't ask you to introduce yourself as well. <laughs> I'm sure you guys would like to know a little more about these wonderful people, so just give me your introduction first, um, um, Sean, and then we'll, we'll move down the line on that. 
Yeah, so I'm Sean McLean, the CEO and founder of Absci, and Absci is a biotech company that's focusing on developing next generation technologies for biomanufacturing and drug discovery. All right, Gustavo. Okay, uh, hello, my name is Gustavo Mahler, I'm the CEO of AGC Biologics. We are uh, one of the largest biologics contract development and contract manufacturing organizations with facilities in Europe, uh, Japan and US, and we are headquartered in Boston, Washington. Okay, I'm State Senator Guy Palumbo, Fighting First. I represent the Fighting First, which is where Canyon Park is, where many of your companies are. Uh, and uh, prior to that, I came out to Seattle in 1998 for a job at Amazon. I uh, worked there for about six years. I quit, uh, and now I own a small dog kennel business called Roscoe's Ranch, which is how I make my money. That's my day job. Uh, and then I got elected in 2016, and now I'm a state senator. Hi, good morning. I'm Kelly Snyder with the University of Washington, the Bothell campus. I've been there 10 years, and in that short period of time, we've gone from 1,700 to 6,000 students. So it's sort of like working for a startup company. You might relate to that. Um, we're doing just extraordinary things in the Bothell area and the region and hoping to help serve so many of your companies in the future. Gustavo, I want to ask you, since you have witnessed this from uh, for several years, the need to hire people, why do you think, why, why has it been so difficult? Can you kind of sum up the, the, the key bullet points that come to mind? Well, there are several factors, right? Um, one of those is mainly that uh, our region went through a slam during 2010-11. Uh, a lot of companies shut it down, some companies left. Uh, we had a couple of hiccups of companies going up and bust. And uh, what that generated is that some people, some of the pool of existing people in the, in the region left. Uh, at the same time, we, we were slow on generating new people from the pipeline of uh, academias. A lot of people get a good formation in the uh, undergree degree and degree careers, but they are not ready to actually jump into a manufacturing, a quality, a QC job or a regulatory job. Uh, they, are, they, are, they have a gap uh, of knowledge there. So they are not, uh, there is no alignment exactly between the, um, the programs in the universities and what is needed by the industry. And that's something that, that is uh, one of the gaps too. Uh, when we started to ramp up like crazy, uh, all the industry in the area, uh, we, we were included in that. Uh, at the beginning, we tap on those people that actually were left behind by the companies that were actually shutting down or reducing their presence in the area. But after that, uh, there was no way to get a sufficient pipeline uh, to fulfill. So what started to happen is we started to relocate people. And uh, that is a very expensive and traumatic process and not always works. Uh, we live in a great area. Uh, I love the, the, I relocated here 10 years ago. I love the area, but the reality is that some people don't, don't like the Seattle area and they end up moving back, right? So, um, so it's not always a successful event. And, uh, and then comes the third part. So we try to tap uh, from outside, and then we started to steal from each other uh, and started to compete for uh, salary on conditions. Uh, but still, it's not enough. Uh, so I think there is the main issues are the huge growth that is very positive, right? But generates an issue. Uh, the misalignment between the, the formation of people and the time it takes to get somebody ready to get to a job and what the industry needs at this point in time. And uh, also, uh, I will say from our side as companies, not having predict that we needed to step in and do some work uh, to actually create, feed that pipeline of people into our direction that I think is what we are trying to do now. Right. Kelly, the University of Washington needs to work with all sectors from aerospace to uh, IT and um, agriculture. How are we doing as a, as a sector in the economy? And what do we need to do to, to do a better job of tapping into the rich pool of, of young people that cross you know, your threshold every day? Great question. So increasing awareness. As the research shows, it's the middle schoolers who really need to have that awareness that this industry is available, that, that they're doing an amazing and incredible things. We heard some just amazing stories of success. Um, but it's also our college students, high schoolers and college students, whether at the two-year level, technical college, or at the four-year level, they really need to understand. And we were on the phone with Leslie on Friday, and we talked about, gosh, 
we have this great discovery core that we have for our first year incoming freshmen and we want to introduce an entire line so that they understand what this sector does. We want to have all of you, maybe not all of you, but many of you, we want to have you in the classroom. We want you talking about the research you're doing. We want you to inspire these students with the great stories of success, but also the challenges because as we all know, Success comes from lots and lots of failure. And making sure that they understand that that persistence, that energy, that drive is there, and that they can take those biology degrees or chemistry degrees or physics degrees or computer science, data management, all of those things are incredibly important with all of you in all of your companies. So getting in the classroom, um, working with our students on internships and capstone projects, seeing who you are. I know you all are super tight on time, and um, but that small bit of time that we could use you, please come to our institutions, not just Bothell, well, of course, we'll all take you at Bothell, but all across the state of Washington, WSU, um, Western, Central, Eastern, we are all doing our best. We hear you. We know that you want the pipeline. You want these Washington State students. They're incredibly talented. They just need to have greater awareness about what you're doing out there. And as we, as we develop programs that, that expose young people to companies, um, this is for you, Senator Palumbo, a lot of our companies are, are small, they're perhaps raising money, many are raising money, um, and in many places, scientists have very little bandwidth to look up, not only to supervise an intern, but to pay an intern, and, and that's, that's a, a vital issue, is to make sure that these are, these are not taking students away from income jobs, which are often uh, you know, an important part of their, their family structure. So can you talk a little bit about how you imagine the legislature responding to the Career Connect Washington project and whether there might be some incentive for companies to, to hire young people? As interns. Sure. I mean, we, we obviously on incentives, we have to get the R&D tax credit back, which, you know, obviously affects your industry, but it's not really related to workforce dev. Um, but uh, we absolutely do. One of the outtakes of the study that we just did that you heard about earlier, the gap analysis, says that we have to put together an Amtec-like, if you know the Boeing uh, facility up in uh, Everett, uh, to train aerospace workers. It's basically a collaboration, a public-private partnership between uh, universities and industry where they bring the, the latest equipment, just like you all have. What's the latest equipment that you want people trained on? Uh, to get those skills there. So I think that that's one of the things that we have to work on that was in the gap analysis. That's a multiple year thing, it costs money. Uh, we're probably gonna be needing to lean on the people in this room to help us fund that, uh, at least in terms of the expertise. So for those smaller companies, if we can get that off the ground, coming and just training a class or teaching a class, or you were talking about, you know, if we have um, high school kids coming in, explaining to them what your job's about, because what we found in Career Connect and all the evidence, whether it's uh, you know computer technology or life sciences, is that if kids in middle school are touching it, if they're feeling it, if they're seeing it, it becomes real for them. It becomes something that they might actually want to do. So they don't wind up at Kelly's door or uh, Eric Murray's door at Cascadia not knowing what they want to do with their lives. They know they need to get a degree, but they don't really know what they want to do. Um, that's really where it starts. So, I mean, even if you can't do an intern, just trying to help local schools to educate kids is something that's low cost that you can probably do as well. I want to jump over to Sean because you're a small company. How many, you have about 38 folks? 28. 28, okay. I'm being ambitious here. Um, and and you, you have a robust internship program, which I want you to tell us about, but I also want you to talk a little bit about the relationship that you have with Washington State University in Vancouver. Yeah, so... We started, uh, we founded the company seven years ago and, and two years into uh, Absi, we decided that we wanted to start empowering the, the next generation of, of scientists and, and innovators. And so we started a, an internship uh, program that actually started with uh, one high school student. And uh, we, we gave her a, a project and allowed her to critically think uh, about uh, what she was working on and, and it, and you could really see her transform and, and get excited about, about the science. And, and that right there was just like, it hit the nail on the head. It's like, we need to be doing more of this and, and really empowering uh, the next generation to be like, hey, you guys can do this. It doesn't matter what age you guys are. And so we have uh, uh, continued this program and now we have uh, basically three uh, different types of internship programs at Absi. So we have a high school internship program, uh, a college internship program, and then a uh, post-grad uh, uh, 
uh, internship program, which is more of a internship to, to hire. Uh, and, and, and through this, we've continued with the project-based uh, uh, internships where they're not just doing the, the grunt work and, and you know, putting uh, you know, uh, washing dishes and, and, and using the autoclave. They're actually doing molecular biology, biochemistry, and, and solving problems that our other scientists are solving. And it's really amazing to see uh, them transform and uh, uh, become scientists. And, and I, I look at some of these high school students, I'm like, y y you're way smarter than I ever was. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so uh, that's what we're doing. And, and this is uh, allowing them to, to see what uh, the biotechnology uh, uh, field is. And, and, and our hope is that they're gonna stay here in, in, the, in the region and uh, take, take jobs either at Absi or other companies in, in, in this region. And so that, uh, that's what we're doing uh, with, with our uh, internship program at Absi. It's fantastic. Gustavo, I, I see you locking in on Sean. Do you have questions for him as, as AGC thinks about its own internship program that is, uh, that is in, in the works? Well, how, how I wasn't there, how difficult it was for you to actually uh, integrate those interns because they, they come for a certain amount of time, they do some work, it takes a ramp up of training and then you know, they may leave after that. So, so how difficult was for you to integrate? Because a lot of companies have ex hesitation on getting interns due to the ramp up and, you know, and then once you train somebody, they leave. You need mm -hmm. to start again, right? So. Yeah, so I, I, I can actually say that all of our interns that we've had have continued to come back each and every year. So they'll have a, uh, a you know, the, the summer break or, or the winter break and they're continually coming back and working on, on, on the projects that they had because they're, they're excited to get back in the lab. And so uh, uh, th this was the first year we did the uh, internship to, to hire and, and we hired all three of our, our interns uh, uh, right afterwards. And so I'd say that uh, uh, it, we found if they're engaged, they, they, they come back and they, and they want to uh, continue working at Absi. Gustavo, do you want to talk a little bit about your vision for, for AGC's project? Well, and you know, we, we have a, a different challenge than other companies, you know, the early phase, that we are a manufacturer, right? And uh, for a while, we were one of the few manufacturers. Now that's ramping up with Juno growing and other companies also building some manufacturing capability. But what we focus on is some process development and manufacturing. So uh, beyond needing people with uh, un uh, undergraduate or graduate degrees, we also need people that will actually perform manufacturing activity or technician level activity. And uh, what we found is that there is very few uh, standard formation of these type of people. You don't have a lot of ways to get people. Uh, and if you get an undergraduate student to run in a manufacturing floor, uh, for a while, they will work, and then they will look for a job that is less painful than that, right? So, so uh, what we wanted to do is actually to create a source of um, of opportunity for people in high school. Uh, I have kids in high school. I see what they can do. I actually was a high school student student that got a technical degree in another country, and uh, and uh, I was able after I was 17 years old to work directly in an operation like the ones we run. So, so we came up with the idea of why couldn't we get people from high school, kids in, uh, in 11th grade, uh, to do an internship, a paid apprenticeship in our company. Uh, so they learn the basic skills. We train them specifically for manufacturing, quality control, quality assurance, and, QC, and, and, uh, and also some technical activities. And uh, they learn these skills and at the end of that time, they can either be hired by us or they have skills that are pretty marketable to get into another company to work in similar activities. Uh, that actually creates several, several advantages. One is uh, one of the statistics we didn't show there is that there is a significant amount of dropout from mm -hmm. high school. That's right. Uh, and this will create a line of sight where you can get a job paying $45,000, $50,000 a year on entry level uh, in a career where you can actually enjoy the, your entire life and highly qualified. So that may create a line of sight for kids that may need to leave the school to work, to, to make money for themselves, to actually continue and finish high school. So they actually can get uh, a decent job at the end. Uh, for us, it creates a source of people that we can train specifically with the skills we really need uh, and grow that, that uh, pool of people that we can actually 
recruit from. And honestly, it creates also an advantage for the whole region because we understand we may not be able to hire everybody, but some of other people that are here will also benefit from that. And we understand that that's part of the risk. But if we, if we don't invest, that will not happen. So we are taking that at this point in time, uh, moving forward, our first uh, group of people will actually start in January this year, in next year, sorry, and we expect to have a bigger group starting after uh, in September after school starts again. Uh, we are working with the um, a high school in Edmonds mm -hmm. uh, on this program, and we are looking now of other high schools in the area, in the Bothell area, that we can uh, we can work with uh, to expand the program. And it's been a really exciting project. Life Science Washington has helped a little bit in putting the right people in the room. And I'll just share this quick anecdote. Um, when uh, the Edmonds School District presented this to their school board, and you know this is still in, in pilot, um, in, in, in the, it was still in the pilot idea stage, um, and, and it's, it's still in development, but one student, they had student representatives on their school board, and after it was presented, the two students came up to the individual who shared the information and said, where do I sign up? So you could just get a sense that this is something that young people are going to respond to. But if they all respond and they're all driving cars, Senator Plumbo, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about infrastructure. Because when you came up with the $300,000 that not only funded the gap analysis, where we, we studied what, what the training is that separates our, our colleges from our, our industry, you also put some of those dollars into infrastructure uh, and economic analysis. So can you talk a little bit about how these, these issues connect and, and your thinking as the region grows to make it movable and and fun? Yeah, absolutely. My favorite topic, transportation, which is basically all my district cares about. So, um, <laughs> uh, you know, in the last 10 years, there's been, and anybody that's in Canyon Park knows this already, but, you know, there's been a flight out of Seattle. They can't, they haven't upzoned their city. As a result, they're not building the housing that people want. They can't afford it there. So where are they moving? They moved to South Snohomish County. Uh, and that happened for the last 10 years. I think for five years running, we were the single family, uh, number one single family new home sales market in the state. Uh, that's now ebbed because you can't afford a for an affordable house now in South Snohomish and North Creek. Um, so people are now moving out to Lake Stevens, Monroe, Darrington, Marysville, uh, which means people keep driving and traffic gets worse. Uh, so stepping backwards, right when I got elected in 2016, I was very lucky. Uh, Governor Inslee held a panel with uh, the Department of Commerce uh, Brian Bonlander as well, um, right after I got elected when Kelly was there with many of the CEOs and people in this room in Canyon Park. And I always ask the same question. And in that meeting and then subsequent meetings that I've been at UW with uh, Kelly with the, the round table that you have, uh, I always ask the same question. What could I do as a state legislator to bring more jobs here and to make the jobs here better? Uh, and I always hear the same two things from your industry. I can't get people in and out of Canyon Park. Um, and uh, I don't have enough talent. And those are just two things that we can solve. Um, so regarding 405, uh, the future, it's going to be a big year next year, I believe. Um, so I'm going to get a little wonky, but the way to fix the issue that we have in 405 is that we have to bet about $450 million for two phases of the 522 and 405 interchange. So it's basically completely redoing that interchange, uh, adding an additional lane capacity going up to 527 to Canyon Park from 522 in both directions. Uh, and then additionally adding direct connectors, what they call direct connectors, so transit and HOV people can just immediately get onto the lane on 405. That will solve a huge amount of our issues up here in the Bothell area. Uh, it costs a lot of money that we don't have. So uh, what it looks like right now is there's probably going to be a big hairy toll vote, as we're calling it, um, that's going to try to put together 167, 405 together in the same tolling corridor and then bond that revenue out. Um, it's a very controversial vote. Um, I, I expect it to come up next year. It may not. It may come up the following year. Um, but if that happens, that's going to be how we fund it. Uh, in the absence of that, we would need a pretty massive gas tax just for our projects for the Canyon Park Life Sciences Cluster. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think that's realistic. So I think real, you know, that's probably the only way we're going to get this done. Um, you know, and then uh, so just on traffic. Um, so that's how we got to go about it. We also have to make the BRT work. So in Sound Transit 3, the only real transit that we got that might alleviate the 405 congestion is BR bus <laughs> rapid transit BRT. Uh, and right now, that BRT is slated to be sitting in those same general purpose lanes that we sit in that are failing between 527 and 522. So it's not even a rapid bus. It's just a bus. 
and it doesn't get you anything. You might as well just be in your car listening to your radio. Nobody's going to get out of a single occupancy vehicle to get in a bus that's in the same traffic. So, you know, we have to make that system work. And then additionally, we have to get a, a parking garage, in my opinion, at Canyon Park. Because uh, when you knock on thousands of doors like I have to get elected, over 21,000 doors, what you hear over and over again in our neighborhood is, I would love to take a bus. I would love to get on a train. I can't park anywhere if I don't get there by 7 a.m. And in Canyon Park, we've got this little postage stamp size lot that we could build up on. Unfortunately, you know, Wastad and, and Sound Transit don't believe in parking. So I'm kind of fighting that alone right now to say, hey, we actually have to get some parking here. Uh, and then finally, there's the ACES group, which some of you may know from Bellevue. I don't know if they're in the room today with Bruce Agnew. Uh, but they're trying to do some shared employee, uh, uh, shared company uh, employee shuttles. And we're going to try to pilot that next year in Canyon Park so that we can get people, your workers, down to the restaurants for lunch or down to the park and ride, down to the transit, between your campuses. Uh, so we're going to be looking for leadership from you as well on that to hopefully help us steer that. Kelly, as, as you hear this, I'm sure you're thinking about your students getting around as well because it is such a car-oriented area. Um, and you also you also mentioned the just the, the growth the growth of, on your campus. You you have your eye on a, a on expansion in in your STEM program. Can you talk a little bit about about that your the new building that is that is in the works and and how that ties into your your game plan for for meeting the the needs for more science and and math uh, graduates. Absolutely. So yesterday we got great news. So there's a whole bunch of steps to get a final vote from the House and the Senate and a final budget for the capital investments. Yesterday, Office of Financial Management had put out the rankings for all the higher education facility capital requests, and Utah Bothell's $35 million STEM building is number two on the list. Yay. We're really excited about that, very thrilled. We can't wait for you all to come down to Olympia to advocate not just for our building, but I looked really closer at the list. And you know, half of the growth buildings that are being proposed by higher education are in life sciences. We hear you. We know that we need to increase our production. We are limited with our literal facilities, number of square feet per student. We need more bricks and mortar. We have to some place some place to put the students. We have to have put our uh, equipment somewhere. We have to put our faculty somewhere. We literally need space to make those things happen. So we're thrilled about that for ourselves. We're also thrilled for the whole industry because we know that we need more capacity across the state of Washington. But of course, Suda Bothell is number one on my heart. <laughs> Senator if I may just jump on that, you, you brought up a good point about the capital infrastructure. It goes to the workforce development. So it doesn't matter if it's life sciences or my, my world where I come from, computer science. You know, those kids, if they graduate from Kelly's program today in cybersecurity, in any of the biology degrees, they've got a job waiting for them, uh, computer science. And in this state, we're the number one uh, importer of baccalaureate STEM degrees. We're not producing enough. And when I got there, one of the first things I realized is that a lot of this is fixable. It's a capital infrastructure bottleneck. So institutions like Kelly's or, or Eric Murray's at Cascadia, it takes on average 14 years to get a new building from the state, from state funding. That's unacceptable, right? I mean, that's a bottleneck we could fix tomorrow. You cannot turn kids away. It's a sin to turn kids away in high demand fields like this where they have great jobs waiting for them because she doesn't have somewhere to teach them. That is unacceptable, and we have to fix that. That's a capital funding problem. I put together a bill in the first year. It didn't really take off. I might bring it back next year. Uh, that would basically just do a public-private partnership. So, you know, you get the naming rights. Let's say uh, her building costs $40 million. Maybe we can do 20 from the state and 20 from industry if it's going to crank out 500 more biologists a year or, or manufacturers or whatever it is. Um, but we have to look for those public-private partnerships that happen at UW Seattle because they have a, a large donor base, but doesn't happen in other institutions. You know, they can't rely on, you know, our friend Bill Gates to, to fund a building at Shoreline for example. But that's where they have a program that's giving you the workers you need. Uh, and if they've got a facility you need, we need to figure out creative ways to do that. Sean, does this, does this resonate with um, the capacity in Vancouver? Or are you seeing the same thing? Yeah, we, we are. And uh, we're actually really excited about uh, the, the partnership we're building with uh, WSU Vancouver. Uh, we are partnering up with uh, the uh, biology and uh, biochemistry departments there to uh, help uh, train the students and build curriculum around biomanufacturing and, 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 and drug discovery uh, uh, techniques that, that, that are needed in the industry. Uh, and, and so we feel like uh, that uh, 
you know, private um, uh, government uh, partnership is, is really necessary to, to ultimately succeed no matter where you're at, whether you're in Seattle or, or uh, in, in Vancouver, Washington. And when you talk about examining curricula or designing programs that, that work hand in glove with um, industry and education, how, how have you been able to gather your colleagues to, to join in that discussion and to make time for it? Any, because I think that we're, I'm asking you that because <laughs> as Leslie and I think about, you know, creating enthusiasm around these issues and talking with our institutions of higher education, we are going to need involvement from industry. You're a small company. You found time for it. So what should we be saying? I think it's just uh, reaching out to the local uh, universities and finding uh, the, the key contacts there. And, and uh, honestly, they're, they're, they're wanting to in, engage and, and be involved in uh, uh, this type of process. And so I think it's just uh, getting out there and knocking on the right doors. And uh, You know, I'm actually, and that, that's great advice, but I'm actually thinking about you didn't, you're a busy guy. Yeah. Other people in, in, in industrial biosciences are really busy. What should we say to those folks in order for them to come to the table? And you're all supposed to listen to this one. I, I think it really starts in the organization that you're at. Uh, one person can't do it in the company. I can't do it myself. I actually got buy-in from the, the whole team um, at AppSci, and they were really excited about this. And so. It was. It turned into a team effort in terms of tackling this this problem, and and so I think it's uh, getting that buy-in from um, the company's leadership and then the rest of the companies uh, to to in order to make the time necessary to to do this. I understand that one of the other keys to your success is that Absai has brought in a chief morale officer. Can we put up the picture of our chief morale officer? There, there she is, Penelope. <laughs> did you know that we were going to put that on there? No, <laughs> Leslie, I did not. Leslie met Penelope. <laughs> Leslie met Penelope when she went down to visit Sean. <laughs> anyway, we, and we just thought he was so cute that we had to put her in her. Um, but all kidding aside, talking to Gen Z is it may be a little bit different. Um, you know, to get them to look up from their phones, or do we need to engage them through social media? You know, I, I've got teenagers, and and I know that they don't necessarily want to hear what I have to say often. So, what should, what is, what's the secret sauce at Absai? Well, uh, our our employees do love that we have a dog friendly office, <laughs> and uh, I have to say, with our chief morale officer uh, here, Penelope, I, I I didn't think that I was uh, uh, going to have to tell our chief morale officer that she can't uh, sleep on the job, but uh, that you know it's happened <laughs> one, once or twice. Uh, but one thing that we've found. Uh, in engaging with the, the, the new generation and, and, and students that are graduating is, is transparency. But, uh, people of, of, uh, of millennials want companies that are transparent with them and, and will tell them the truth about uh, the, the company and the organization. And so we uh, try our, our best to communicate what's really going on in, in Abzai. What, where are the strengths? Where are weaknesses? Uh, and, and we also have a lot of fun as well. But that's been what, something that we've gotten really good feedback from is, is, is transparency and, and being real with uh, your employees. And uh, whether it's uh, you're, you're going through a rough time or, or you're sharing in, in, in the excitement and the growth. The other thing I would think, and I know this is what brought many people in this room to the, to the industry, is uh, the focus on human health, on, on making the world a better place. Gustavo, is that part of your part of part of your uh, vision with these with the, the students you're going to be working with, um, and and your company in general, working towards internal communications that emphasize we're all working to to save lives. Yeah, that's actually a very important point. You mentioned also how to engage kids at the early stage. Uh, I personally volunteer in, high, in middle school sometime too, right? So, and it's interesting because, you know, uh, there is a lot of STEM programs going on now, but the yes in the STEM program is very low. I, I think mm. we, we're a very tech-oriented region, and not always the kids see the the, the side of the yes on 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 that side. And um, when you explain kids, and then when you explain. Uh, 
interns and your own employees, you know, the impact of the work we do. In our case, we work with, at this point in time, uh, globally 120 different molecules that we are developing. And when you develop all those products, not all will make to become a commercial product, but many do. And when you bring patients and they hear the story from patients, as was referred in the previous talks, uh, on the impact of these products, they realize that this job is not just a job. Uh, I, I see around, and probably everybody around this room didn't choose this job for being just a job. It, it has a ultimate meaning of providing treatment to people that are suffering a terrible disease and cure them or help them manage that disease through life. And it has an impact for those patients and also for, uh, for their families. So we actually reinforce that message within our company, but also with the, with the people that we are trying to bring in. Uh, in this case, in these programs that we're trying to do with high schools and the programs we do with internships with, with colleges, that, that this is not just a job in the lab where you do cool stuff and touch very cool pieces of equipment but, uh, and have fun with other people, but also you are creating products that are actually saving lives and, and it, it have a huge impact in the overall community as well and the patients. So that's something we, we emphasize all the time when we uh, when we talk internally with our company, as I agree with Sean, it's important to have this transparency with employees. We have monthly meetings where, where our management directly talk to the employees on what's going on with the company, but also what are the treatments that we are developing and how they are impacting patients. I want to pause there and um, ask if anybody in the audience would like to uh, ask a question of our, of our panel about workforce development, about uh, the challenge of bringing young people um, into the awareness of bioscience careers. So if you have any questions, please feel free to. Oh yeah, we'll have to borrow Sean's. First of all, does anyone in the audience have a question? So I'd like to ask Kelly, because you are really representing our institutes of higher education in, in addition to UW Bothell. Um, and as I said, in that gap analysis, we had six community and technical colleges participating, as well as UW Bothell. And you've now seen the report findings. Um, as I said, these, the leaders from these institutions have begun to convene and think about how do we start moving forward. And there are many actions that need to be taken. What do you at UW Bothell, but also thinking about our community and technical colleges, what do you need from industry to move these things forward. So we've got some great degree programs, but we found out a lot of them are not really relevant in the fullest sense to what industry needs. If we're gonna turn that around, how do we do it? And again, specific ideas. Well, I think it's a partnership. Um, first, this report was extremely helpful to tell us, not just us, but others, where are those gaps in our curriculum? Uh, you shared with us what it is that we need to do. We're going to go do that. We are meeting with our faculty. We're rounding them up. We're working with the community and technical colleges and putting their faculty with ours and saying it's, it's a pipeline, too. We get lots of transfer students, so we need to make sure that they're ready to go. We turn away 200 students a year for our STEM program, um, and that's just not acceptable. So, um, And that's growing. Our, our STEM program at Eda Bothell is... Um, a third of our population now. The students and their families are getting it. They know that there's something, there's those jobs out there. They not, don't know sure what they are yet, but we're gonna try to figure out. So increasing awareness, I mentioned that earlier, having you in the classroom, helping us on our advisory boards, uh, mentoring our students, coming to the career fairs, showing what those types of degree offerings are, that they need, what type of skills and talents. Uh, it was actually on a tour a couple years ago at AGC, and um, what we learned when we were designing our last STEM building, we needed to have a clean room. Students were not coming out prepared to go work in clean rooms, so we modified the design, we put a clean room in, and we worked with industry to design it, and now our students are coming out better. Um, but those are sort of major capital changes, but the fine tuning in the curriculum is incredibly important, and we want to do that. Other higher education institutions want to do that, and we need you in Olympia. Our senator, our all of his colleagues there in Olympia, they all need to know, the governor needs to know, what is it that you need um, in your industry and how can we in higher education support you? Is it capital investment? Is it operating? We need all those things. So emails, letters, tweets, all of those things are incredibly important and very powerful. 
Yeah, if I could jump on there, I'll, I'll give you a specific, one specific homework item that would be very helpful. So we've got this gap analysis. That came because of two years of me, you know, badgering budget writers for some funding. Uh, so it's very, uh, it's a personality business. So Christine Rolfus, who writes the budget right now, believed in the mission that I was talking about. She gave us the, she appropriated the money. It's now going to do some really good stuff. Uh, but it's a very personal relationship. So this new study that we're doing and the, the colleges are putting together, what is it that we need? Does it, does it involve a professor? Does it curriculum development? What, what is the ask for this array of east side schools to provide the workforce that you need? Because one of the things, you know, we, we found that technical writers in that, in that thing, you know, it's fine to have a biology degree or, or this certificate, but you weren't getting enough technical writers. Okay, we need to fix that. What does that cost? What's the, what's the action item? And there's going to be a document that basically I'm going to have to bring the budget writers next year and say, I need you to fund this so that we can give you the workforce you need on the east side. And that also goes for Spokane and, and you know, Vancouver as well. Um, I'm going to need you to sign a letter to say you support this. And it sounds like a silly, easy to do thing, but it's actually how the legislature works. So the more people that I can get onto a letter saying, fund this, please, budget writers, the, the easier it is to get it funded. So if every company in this room today signs that letter and says, you need to fund this higher ed ask, we'll get it done. But if it's just me out there, it's, it's much harder to do. And that also involves, I saw Representative uh, Slatter here today as well, who comes from your industry. It's basically the entire east side. I need to get the east side legislators that represent everybody from Bellevue up to Shoreline to sign that letter and say, fund this and make it a priority for this industry next year. That's the perfect place to put up our call to action, which just kind of reminds you of what um, what we've been talking about and, and where you can engage. So there's, there it is. Um, so you, we need you to share your stories. Go out and talk to class, classes. Um, we need you to, to tell them what a, great, what a great industry this is, to help out with science fairs. Um, Shoreline is going to be putting on a science fair, and, and they may be calling in need of mentors. Answer their call and help out. Um, our, higher, our institutions of higher ed will, will need guest lecturers. So if you have a particular um, uh, s story of, uh, that, that evolved from your lab and you want to share it, you know, if, if you can't find the right institution, you know, call Life Science Washington and, and we'll figure out you know, who would like to hear that story. Or just reach out yourself to, um, to, to these, the, the biology, um, or the, the biotech program at Shoreline, the biology program, uh, bioengineering program at Bellevue College. There are lots of good ones out there. And then just underscoring, you know, we've got to talk to our representatives to make, make them aware that, that all these issues are a high priority. And with that, I will say thank you. And thank you so much for our panelists. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you, Meg, for orchestrating such a great panel, and thank you to all of our panelists. Um, wow, a couple hours goes by fast, and we've been so happy to have you join us. I really want to thank again Mark Alice for giving such an incredible, motivating, and exciting uh, talk to us. We can see there are a lot of great things in the works, and um, I seem to recall last year at this time we were all a little bit nervous. What does it mean? What is this acquisition going to mean for our region? Um, I just, I, I want to end with kind of one observation. I was thinking about what's different now, perhaps, than some of the periods of, of Seattle, the Puget Sound, and the state of Washington's history in life sciences. And what has hit me, because believe me, as many as examples as we gave today of great growth and success, they were a fraction of the number I could have given. I, my staff like constantly made me pare down my remarks uh, to keep them in the time frame. Where my recollection, not having been here but been in the industry for decades, is you would always hear about a great company getting started here. Really as much a great drug or a great device, right, that just launched something forward. And then once FDA approved, you'd see the acquisition the company would go, there'd be some talent from that company spread throughout the community, but not a huge pool. But it would continue to seed the next company. 
What we see right now is there are a lot of companies here of all stages of development, and we're seeing incredible momentum and incredible growth, not just limited to one, which makes us less vulnerable. It makes our ecosystem grow. It, it reflects the, the comments that were made uh, by Mark about our area. We are really becoming more permanent and growing, not so fragile, not so, oh my gosh, what happens if? And in fact, what we're seeing is big power players want to be here because of what we've got. And we can, in fact, with investment from our community, from supporting our entrepreneurs to making sure our growing companies have the workers that they need, which is going to take all of us. We just can't say it enough. It's too easy to walk out of the room and say, well, that was great. I enjoyed that for a couple of hours, and then put our heads back down. We've got to tackle these issues head on. But if we do, what we have here is amazing. And it's the envy of many places in the country and the world. But we have got to be willing to invest in the development and celebrate the commercialization, not just the incredible research we have going on here. So I leave you with that thought. We can be anything we want to be. We control our destiny. Um, and Life Science Washington looks forward to working with all of you to bring these things about and to continue this growth trajectory that we're on. Thank you for being here. Uh, drive safely home. We look forward to seeing you next year. And of course, we look forward to seeing you a whole lot sooner at Life Science Innovation Northwest. Please save the date, April 24th and 25th. And with that, have a good, good weekend.